Let's go ahead and read our, um, our foundation text for this teaching. 1 Peter 4, uh, chapter 1, verses 14 through 19, it says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your flesh. I mean, in your ignorance. But as, you which, uh, but as he would have called you as holy, so be ye holy in all manner of life, or manner of life, in lifestyle, actions, because it is written, Be ye holy as I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect to persons judges according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you were not, it was how I was not, redeemed with corruptible things. Say you, I am not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold. You know, there's a lot of people who spend their whole life trying to get silver and gold, and the Bible says it's corruptible. That went over real big. Okay. And from your vain conversation or lifestyle received by tradition from your fathers. But, now the word but here is the antithesis. You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He said this morning that Webster's defines precious as highly valuable and costly, highly esteemed, cherished, and beloved. So the blood of Christ is precious. It's highly valuable. It is costly. It is highly esteemed. It is cherished, and it is beloved. Remember that's, how many remember the psalm? You know, we, we made a course out of it uh, 15, 20 years ago. The church did. Somebody in the church did. Lord, you are more precious than silver, more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds and more to be desired. Amen? Isn't that right? And nothing that I desire compares to you. See, the blood of Jesus is, is more precious than silver, more costly than gold, more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing we desire it can be compared to our desire to have him in our life, to be bought, to be purchased of him, to be made one with him. Can you say amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah. All righty. So <clears throat> we talked about this morning how the, the, the importance of blood, how the, the, the uh, theological term substitution comes into play in the church. Jesus became our sin offering. He became what we were so we could become what he is. We became the righteousness of God in him. Now, righteousness is a legal term, uh, meaning in right standing with. All right? Some people get the idea that righteousness is some kind of, you know, me, me, is equated to holiness. No, you can be righteous and be living unholy. Now, God tells you to be holy even as he's holy. Amen. That means, see, holiness is, 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 is par, in part uh, how you conduct yourself. Righteousness is your position in standing with God. Amen. Now, can I lose my righteousness? Yep, just like Adam did. Adam lost his place with God. But Adam knew what he was doing when he did it, too. He made a decision to do that. Now, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, down there around verse 6, begins to, dis not Hebrews 11, Hebrews chapter 6, begins to discuss how a believer could lose his standing with God and tr trample on the foot the blood of the Son of the God, the blood of the covenant where everything is sanctified. And he goes on and says this, and if, he, if he's done that and put him to an open shame, there remaineth no more repentance from sin. So uh, that's not a good thing to do. Not smart. Amen. Can you say amen? So <clears throat> we talked about this one about substitution. We talked about how that we are declared righteous. Now, again, a legal term. We've been justified or declared righteous by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. So let's move on tonight. We're going to cover some other things. There's about three or four other things we want to talk about. I don't know if we'll get it through all of them tonight. We might. We might not. If we do, we do. We don't, we don't. We'll just pick it up next week if we don't. Did you get tongue-tied there? Amen. The next is redemption in his blood. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> now, redemption is the process whereby you are declared righteous. It is by redemption that you have been declared righteous. You have to be redeemed. Amen? Ephesians chapter 1 says in verse 7, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. And so here he says, we were purchased or redeemed. Now, redeemed means to buy back. How many remember the old s and green stamps? Had your book. You go to the grocery store, 
You get the little, and then when you pull a certain amount of, uh, of groceries, they hit the little button on the machine, it pop out uh, a little SH green stamps. And you take them home to your little booklet, and you, you taste them all in there. Y'all remember that? And then you had another book with all the things that you could, kind of like the old um, uh, Wheel of Fortunes, you know? Uh, you, you couldn't, they, they didn't walk over there with money back in the olden days, in the early days. They walked out of there, they had, to, they had to buy with what they earned on the show, the furniture or the stuff that was four times higher than where it really was in real life, anywhere else. Well, that's Nature Green Stamps had a redemption book. You'd go in and you would redeem your S&H Green Stamps. Never heard of those, huh? How many have heard of S&H Green Stamps? How many have never heard of S&H Green Stamps? Y'all have missed half your life. All right. We'll have to educate you here. And so then you would go, you would go to the store and you would take the book and you would order all, whatever you wanted, but once you got enough, accumulated enough of the stamps to order what was in the book you wanted to get. You redeemed it. You purchased it. Okay? So you, 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 you had a redemption uh, through the stamps of a, of a product. You purchased it. So redemption means to purchase. Okay? We've been redeemed. We've been bought. We've been purchased. Now, I'm going to tell you something. And it's a mess up some theology for some people who, just don't, who need to read their Bibles better. You're not your own. You can't do anything you want to do. You've been bought with a price. He's your Lord and Master. I'm a child of God. Yeah, He's still your Master. Amen. We need to get back to the idea. You know, we talked about a couple weeks ago that we need to have the attitude of a servant. You don't have to act like a servant. Woe is me and lowly is me and live, you know, on barely get along the street. But you need the attitude of a servant. That he's your, he, he is your master. He's your Lord. He's your overseer of your life. Jesus asked this question with him. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I tell you? Or do not the things I say? <laughs> that one ever big. Ah, I, I, I said enough right there. That was a mouthful. Enough to think about for a while. Amen. So he says here that whom we have redemption. So you've been bought by his blood. Remember we read earlier in, 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 uh, back here in our opening text. It says here we've been not, we were not bought. Hallelujah. Um, you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Hallelujah. So our redemption has come through the blood of Jesus. Can you say glory to God? So there was a mighty, you have to go out and listen this morning. We don't have time to cover this morning all over again. There was a mighty price paid to redeem you. Now, God, here's the beautiful side. And listen, you know, one side of it is there's an awful, awfully uh, expensive price paid for your salvation, for you to be redeemed. But at the same time, we can come on the other side of that and go, God deemed us so valuable and precious that he gave that which was of the highest value that he had to buy us with. Jesus. He shed his blood. That's how much, that's how valuable and precious you are to God. Amen. He didn't save you because he just didn't have anything better to do. Come on now. He didn't send Jesus, well, you know what, Jesus, look, I'm kind of bored up here in heaven. And uh, why don't you go down there and, and, and save them, the, the, those, those bunch of renegades down there. That's not how he looked at it. For God so loved the world, for God deemed the world. I, I, now, I'm not making this up. Doc, Dr. Ken Stewart, uh, who was the, um, the international provost of Raymond Bible Training Centers when I was there, Doc Stewart, he says, you know, for God so loved the world, or for God so deemed the world valuable and precious, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He took his son and with his blood purchased humanity. Now you could be, listen, if you're going to be dumb, you have to be tough. Because if you reject that, that's dumb. If you, and then you're going to have to be tough because hell's a long, long, long place, time and place to live in. I don't believe in hell. Well, you can go out here on the interstate and go, I don't believe in tractor trailers, and you'll find out they exist. You can stand there and say, I don't believe in them all day long, and you're going to come encounter, you're going to come in an account, in, into an encounter with one eventually, just standing in, in one of the lanes out there on the interstate, and you're going to find out, well, of course, you'll be too late then because you, you'll find out they exist when you have that momentary moment of being crushed. 
Just you're, you're saying I don't believe it exists doesn't make it not exist. Amen. So now, so God deems you so valuable and precious that he sent Jesus to redeem you with the precious blood of Christ. Can you say I've been redeemed? By the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, Colossians 1.14 reiterates this again. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Acts, the 20th chapter, the 28th verse. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, talking to pastors, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Amen. Now, the blood of Jesus is so valuable and precious and, and, and that it could, it's of such great and high value that it was able to purchase all of humanity, hallelujah, away from the authority of the enemy and bring it into the kingdom of God. Can you say hallelujah? Aren't you glad? I am glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Are you all here? Y'all going home? Jesus redeemed us with his blood. He purchased us. Say, I've been purchased. Now, understand that if you, you know, he purchased you so he could reconcile you to the Father. His blood was spent, the, the, the um, purchasing power of his blood was spent in purchasing you. Hallelujah. You know, you hear the term now, uh, I think Andy Pennant reti is retiring at the end of the season. He just, and he, he said in his announcement that he's going to retire from baseball this, at the end of the season, that he's leaving it all on the table. He's, he's, he, there's nothing left to give. I want you to know, God left it all on the table when he sent Jesus and Jesus shed his blood. There's nothing left to spend. It's all been done. There, there, there is no more sacrifices. There is no more going to the cross. There is no more... Uh, there is no one else that can redeem us. It's all, it's all been done. It's all been put on the table. Now it's up to you to receive and, and accept what he did. Somebody say glory. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. So not only are we redeemed by the blood, we're forgiven by his blood. Look at 1 John chapter 1. I'm going to upset the new, the new Gracies or the, you know, the people who get off on the deep end. Sorry, this is written to the church. Keep believing the other stuff. You'll be messed up. My friend Guy Dunnett was, was doing a thing recently, and he, he says, if you'll notice here, about three times in this first chapter, he goes, if you say that you don't, and then he answers the question. These are all statements. You know, like here, verse 6, it says, if we say we have fellowship in him, walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, thank God. Well, how does that cleansing power work? By walking in the light. Well, what's that mean? Well, didn't you hear, didn't you, see, you understand something? These were men who were writing with a Jewish background. What did, what did the 100th and, and, and 19th Psalm say? I believe, I believe about 100, verse 130. I might be wrong. Yeah, that's what it says. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all our unrighteousness. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our unrighteousness. How are you going to stay in that place? Keeps to walking in the word. Hallelujah. You keep walking according to the word. You walk according to the word and the blood will keep working on your life. Hallelujah. Amen. It will sustain you when you when you, when you're not, don't have a full grasp on it, but you're walking in the light you do have. I'll tell you something, if you walk in the light, you do have God, God, God's merciful. I said God's full of mercy. Now, if you're going to be a bonehead and somebody come on and show you the Bible, I don't believe that, that's, that's not walking in the light. So you're going to have to be tough. Boneheadedness will get you, get you in a tough place. Glory to God. You know, think you know everything. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. How many think they know everything? Don't raise your hand. We'll have to cast that lying devil out of you. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. You walk around staying out of fellowship with all people all the time, you're not walking in the light. That went over real big. 
I can't think of anything that's gone over any bigger in the past five weeks than that statement right there. If you're, if you're staying out of fellowship with people, hello, then apparently you're not walking in the light as he's in the light. Because if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ is uncleanses us from all unrighteousness or all sin. Hallelujah. Well, let's walk in the light. Amen? I said, let's walk in the light. Then verse 8 says, a new commandment. I write unto you which, you which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Hallelujah. I'm in chapter 2. Sorry. If we, uh, I look right over in chapter 2 and just, and just kept reading. Chapter 8, verse 8, chapter 1. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness or all things that would stand in our right relationship with God. That would stand in the way of our right relationship with God. The blood of Jesus, amen. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us. So how does he cleanse us? He cleanses us with the blood. From all, uh, from anything that stands between you and your father and being in right relation with him. He'll cleanse you from it. You need to stay cleansed from it. Why? Because you hold on to it long enough, it can become a permanent thing in your life. It can break your position with him. I know this. If you're a hyper-Calvinist, I know you just passed out and have to have the down one one called. I've, I've told y'all before, I'm a Calvinist. I'm somewhere between Calvin and Armenian. I'm, I'm in the middle somewhere. Amen? I believe we're eternally secure as long as we walk according to the word all the days of our life. Amen? I don't believe just because you mess it one time, you're going to go to hell. But I don't believe you can just, like Luther got such a revelation, he said that he can believe a man can commit 10,000 fornications and not lose his salvation. I can't believe a man who loves God and serves God can want to go commit 10,000 fornications. If you're full of God, if you're being holy as he's holy, if you're walking in the light as he's in the light, Maybe a busy man. Anyway, isn't that right? Everybody gets real. Say stuff like that, people get. Hallelujah. So, we're forgiven by his blood. Say, thank God, the blood of Jesus. For his forgiveness is based on the blood. Hallelujah. Now, let's, look back. let's run over to Hebrews 9. I love Hebrews 9. If you want to know what my favorite chapter in the Bible is, it's Hebrews 9. Glory to God. Glory to God. Verse, what, what we just start in verse 1. Uh, it's kind of hard to get here without. You can even back up to chapter, verse 13 of the previous chapter. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And he's saying the old covenant. Amen. The Old Testament became, or the, the Bible, or, the, or whatever they have for Scripture, up until, uh, I forgot the, the, the Hebrew name for that. But for what they had, uh, once Jesus went to the cross and died and was raised and established the new covenant, it became the Old Covenant. Hallelujah. Not that, not that it wasn't true, but it was fulfilled in Christ. When Jesus said it's finished, he meant the, he meant the Mosaic Law and the demands of the law on humanity was, was finished in him. The, the, the work and plan of redemption wasn't even finished when Jesus said that. He had to go, he had to become, he had to go pay the price of man's sin and be raised from the dead, take his blood into the, to the mercy seat of God, and God accept it, and, and then sit down as the high priest of our, of our profession. So when he said it's finished, he was talking about the old Mosaic law. The Levitical priesthood was done. Not his work. He wasn't done. Hallelujah. Then verily, the first covenant also had ordinances and divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, uh, which is called the holiest of all, or holy of holies, which had the golden censure and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot, the head manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. 
and over it the cherubims of glory overshadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, apparently, it was, it was so awesome that Paul couldn't even talk about it. Yeah, now, now chariots of fire, not chariots of fire, but Raiders of the Lost Star was probably pretty cool, you know, whatever of it. But that may not be quite accurate, but, you know, that's okay. You get, a, you get an image. How many ever saw Raiders of the Lost Ark with Harrison Ford? Okay. All right. Well, the, the Ark of the Covenant, that, that, was, that would be somewhat accurate, at least according to human uh, interpretation, because Paul actually said here, we can't even speak particularly about it. So I, our interpretation probably is, you know, in that, in that movie, probably still not quite accurate. Hallelujah. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always in the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, but the second went the high priest alone every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, and which offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now remember, they said this, is a, this was a figure. The Holy Ghost said this, uh, the Holy Ghost signified that the way into the holiest of all was not met yet, made yet manifest. In other words, the real one. The real one. The heavenly holiest of all was not yet made manifest. The access to it was not made manifest to man again. Because man had fallen. He no longer had access to it. He did. Until the fall. I said he did until the fall. Hallelujah. And listen to this which was a figure for the time then present in which were both offered gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood in meats and drinks and divers washing and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation. But Christ, oh, everybody say, but Christ. And this is one of those Holy Ghost buts. Amen? See, a lot of times you hear the pastors talking in the church and the people want to go, but, but, but. Well, here's a but that's good. Amen? He said, but Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, not of the earth. It wasn't the earthly tabernacle. It wasn't of this realm. It wasn't of this sphere. Hallelujah. He became the high priest of a better tabernacle or a more perfect tabernacle. And then he says this, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood, hallelujah, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled the unclean, clean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. I see, they would cleanse their flesh for a year. How much more? How much more? Oh, glory, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge what? Not your flesh. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Ooh, glory. I said glory. Hallelujah. Thank God he entered in. Hallelujah with his own blood. Our conscience is purged by the blood of Jesus. Our conscience has been cleansed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. See, that's why you shouldn't be saying I'm a sinner saved by grace. You, your conscience was purged from those things to serve the living God. Well, I heard that all my life. You were wrong all your life. Everybody was telling you that was wrong all your life. I'm just old. They got, they got a song. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. You know, sing, they, people sing that. Sit around and say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm yelling this old, this old gospel quartet kind of song. But the Bible says that Christ entered in once and for all to obtain an eternal redemption for us. Hallelujah. And we know it said this. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. Man is not flesh. Man is a spirit. He has a soul. He lives in a body. <clears throat> Hallelujah. 
under the old covenant. They could get their flesh covered up. Remember we talked about that this morning. How did those ordinances just kept getting covered up? They'd uncover them at Passover each year, shed the blood of animals, get them covered up for another, add all the new ones to it, and cover them up another year. Then Jesus came and pulled back the covers and grabbed all those handwriting of ordinances against us and nailed it, uh, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Glory to God. Amen. How to do what for? So we would have no more remembrance of sin. Somebody shout glory. Stop calling yourself a sinner saved by grace. I said stop calling yourself a sinner saved by grace. What am I supposed to call myself? An heir of God. A joint heir with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The righteousness of God in Christ. A saint. You don't need a church to get together and study your life for miracles or whatever and then decree you and give you sainthood. God's already given it to you. You're a saint. And I'm not talking about um, the movie guy. Huh? Val Kilmer, I'm talking about you know, the, the, series, the old series that Roger Moore was in and then Val Kilmer did the movie, The Saint. You know, he, was, he just took all the names. Listen, you know, we got churches that, that make people saints, that call them saints. Paul said to the whole church that you're saints. You're called to be saints. Paul administers sainthood on you through the word. But what do we call ourselves in the church? Most of the time, we call ourselves sinners saved by grace. We preach about it. We get up and tell, oh, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. You were an old sinner. You were saved by grace. But now, the Bible says he entered in once and for all to obtain an eternal redemption for you. And if the blood of bulls, goats, and ashes of a heifer would sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more? How? Not, oh, how much more? How much more shall the blood of the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world Hallelujah, who entered in and attained that redemption for us. How much more shall his blood? See, y'all should be shouting. <clears throat> How much more shall his blood purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It is so hard for people to serve God when they're living in the conscientiousness of their past sin. Now, I'm not talking about sin you're living in right this moment. That's not what I'm talking about here. See, that's, that, that's where people get mixed up. Once you put it under the blood, it's past sin. Does that make sense? Once you've asked God to forgive you, it's under the blood. It's, it's past sin. You don't need to dredge it up anymore. Now, the devil will dredge it up. But you know what? You just go tell him to put it back. That's under the blood. You ain't got no business over there messing around there in the first place. You, really, you, you obtained that illegally. Therefore, it no longer sta has legal standing in the court of redemption. Hallelujah. Glory to God. They're throwing that out. Is that the evidence that can't be brought and introduced? Hallelujah. Can't you see Jesus? Remember, he's, the high, he's our advocate. Legal term again, lawyer. And the devil comes walking in and says, Hey, Brother Bill, on September 4th, 1968 did such and such. And Jesus said, wait a second, that's blood dripping off of that. I said, there's blood dripping off of that. Well, yes, yeah, so well, but I can read it. And Jesus says, turns to the high court's supreme judge and says, he's illegally trying to introduce evidence that's already been washed in the blood, my blood. And then the ruling comes down. This cannot be introduced into this court as an accusation against Brother Bill. Hallelujah. And see, you've got to remember all the things the devil tries to bring. And listen, he'll try to get you to start talking about it. He'll try to get you to incriminate yourself before the court of God. But here's what Jesus does when you start incriminating yourself. What are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. 
That's under the blood. And see, it's been redacted. You know what happens when they, when they get top secret information and, they, and, and then they get, they, people get a court r- ruling that says, you've got to bring that to the court. Hello? And let us look at it, or to the Senate or whatever. And, and then they have this, something they call redacted. That is information that can't be released. And so they'll pick up a piece of paper and it's marked out all over the place here and there. Names, you know, places, dates. It's been redacted. When you pick yours up... <laughs> The whole thing is washed in red blood. It's been completely redacted. They look at it and say, there's nothing here to see. Why? Because the blood of Jesus purged your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You need to walk in the light of the purging of his blood. Can you say amen? I said, can you say amen? His blood was shed to purge your conscience. From dead works. We read Colossians 1 this morning. That how he took this hand right. We quoted it again tonight. I keep coming back there. There's something there. Somebody, the Lord's working on you. All the things that were written against you. All the charges. Those handwriting of ordinances were the charges laid against you by the accuser of the brethren. He brought suit against you. Hallelujah. It's like you, everything you had is on a DVD. Hallelujah. And the blood of Jesus is a degauser. Or gals, is it gals or gauser? Huh? It's a degauser. And you know, you're thinking, you're going, mm-hmm, rub over a CD or a, a, a magnetic tape or anything. And what happens? It completely erases. Now, we're not, look, we're not talking about where they can go back and put it in the computer and, and reread it. Y'all do know most of the time when you say delete a file, it's not really deleted. What happens is it, it goes into the, to the um, on a, on a, I think on computers, a VTOC, a volume table of contents, or, or your FAT tables, huh? file allocation table, I'm sorry, VTOC is, is, is system threes. On your file allocation table, and tells it it's not there anymore. It's still there. And when right, and when old Norton Utilities, you can go get it and bring it back. It just, it, it just changed a little letter, says I'm not here anymore. It was still there. So that's why, you know, we, people say, well, you know, the FBI is coming. I'm going to delete my hard drive. Hey, baby, if you delete your hard drive and, and you don't degauss it, it's, they're going to get it. You say degauss it, it completely scrambles all the electronic, everything, and, and just, it ain't there anymore. Jesus' blood is a degausser to the handwriting of ordinances that was levied against you by the accuser of the brethren. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. And so they're gone. And then Jesus says, as your high priest, you're forgiven. Not only are you forgiven, I cleanse your conscience. He degauses your conscience. Yeah, I know you did because I saw you do it. There's no record of it. That's just a false accusation. Man did those things no longer exist. And born again. Hallelujah. Yeah, but you did it after you got saved. It's been washed in the blood. It's been degaused. Gaused. I don't know, I'll call it degauser forever. I, probably, I just have to. It's been degaused. We still have one of those back in the audio room somewhere. How many of you have ever used one? You don't even know what it is. It uses electric magnetic fields to scramble electronically recorded data. Or anything, music, anything. You put it on anything. You don't want to get it near anything that has, is electronically recorded because it will toast it. Bzzz. But think about that now. We do that in the natural with natural things. Jesus, the head of the church, has already done that with spiritual things. Hallelujah. Satan comes up to accuse you about something you did, and you say, whoa, devil. <laughs> Let's have a talk to that, buddy. Produce your evidence. Well, I saw you. Produce it. That's hearsay. That's not accepted in heaven's court. 
If God's not going to hold you accountable for what's under the blood, why are you doing it? Well, I got a brother or sister who's holding it against me. That's their problem. I said, that's their problem. Y'all hear you going home. If they've got a problem with it, that's their problem, not yours. Now, go ahead and put it under the blood. Make sure you've got your part under the blood. But he said he'll purge your conscience. And that's been one of the hardest things for the church. Now, see, here, here is where Kenyon used to talk about, and then, you know, others picked up on it. But he used to talk about sin consciousness. Can I say something? These bozos who think sin consciousness is, you know, feeling bad for sinning don't understand what they're talking about. Sin consciousness is completely and constantly reminding yourself of past sin that's all, that you've already gone and gotten straight with the Lord and allowing the past to hold you back. If you're living in sin right this moment, that is not sin consciousness. That is your heart condemning you for not living right. There is a difference between your heart condemning you for not living right and sin consciousness. But we got people running around teaching that if, you know, you're out, uh, I mean, whatever, whatever sin you want to come up with, smoking dope, shooting up, drinking, fornicating, whatever else you can come up with, and that you feel bad about what you've done, then that's sin consciousness. No, that's your conscience telling you to get it right with the Lord so you can be purged from its consciousness in you. It's your heart saying that's wrong and standing between you and the Father. Get rid of it. Now, once you've gotten rid of it, once you've dealt with it, and it's plaguing you, that's sin consciousness. Once you've gone to the Father and said, you know, I did such and such, and Father, I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness by the blood of Jesus. I accept and receive that forgiveness now in Jesus' name. I am cleansed of that. My conscience is purged of that. Now, if you keep coming back week after week after week, Lord, I'm so sorry I did that. Lord, I'm so, that's sin consciousness. There's a big, 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 big difference than you being out robbing banks on a weekly basis and starting to feel bad about it, and then somebody tells you, no, you can't feel bad about that. You're under grace. You're not accepting the work of God. You know, no, 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 no. Your heart's condemning you because you, you, haven't, you haven't taken it to the Lord and gotten cleansed of it so he can cleanse your conscience. Now, remember this, that when you, when you ask God to forgive you, the Bible says this, godly sorrow work of repentance. What's worldly sorrow? I got caught. Now, the woman caught in adultery, caught in the very act, when Jesus began to ride on the ground, they all walked out one by one. They did not have godly sorrow. They, just, they had worldly sorrow. <coughs> it's amazing. They brought the woman and left the man. Why? Because he's probably one of them. He's probably some ruler in the Sanhedrin or, or, or whatever. And his reputation was at stake. So they're going to kill the woman. They just like, they're going to have a cover up. She said, where are your accusers? She said, I have none. Neither do I. Now, listen, remember when Jesus said this? This is something people always miss. Neither do I condemn thee. What did he say? Go and sin no more. That's what he said. I'm not going to condemn you that you go from this place and don't sin anymore. Don't go back and do this again. See, some people teach you know, that the forgiveness of God, the mercy of God, and the grace of God is, I don't condemn you. I mean, they leave off the part. Don't go and sin no more. They leave that part off. Because that's legalism. That's not legalism. That's freedom. Know ye not to whom you yield your members? The, that, whoever you yield your members to, you are the servant of that person or that one. You yield your members as sin unto unrighteousness. Hello? You become the servant of unrighteousness. Now that was New Testament Paul. Romans 6. Hello? 
How many are here? How many got up and left? Hallelujah. All right, so our conscience is first. We're going to stop right there. We're going to pick it next week because we're going to get into the new covenant in his blood and victory in his blood for next Sunday on the fifth Sunday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.